The following is a local resident producer's program. The program content is the sole responsibility of the producer and does not necessarily reflect the views or policies of CATV2, Oshkosh Community Access Television, the City of Oshkosh, the Oshkosh Cable Television Advisory Commission, or Time Warner Cable. Hi everyone, welcome to another edition of I and Oshkosh. I'm Cheryl Hentz and joining me as a co-host this evening is uh, Paul Esslinger from the Oshkosh Common Council. Uh, just about an hour or so before we started taping, uh, Tony Palmieri had an emergency situation come up and uh, so he could not be here. Um, hopefully everything with um, him is, is good and um, Paul, thanks for pitching and pitching in here and jumping in at the last minute. My pleasure and I'll almost, apologize to your viewers already for having me. <laughs> almost here. the very last minute. That being said, uh, we are pleased to welcome back to the show, she's been here a couple times in the past, uh, <coughs> former school board member uh, Teresa Thiel. These days Teresa is uh, still a volunteer, very active volunteer in the Oshkosh area public school system and a private citizen. Uh, Teresa had contacted us following uh, the airing of our show with Michelle Monty and Leon Schaefer, who had uh, talked about, uh, among other things, uh, things that they saw inherently wrong within the school district and the way it's operating. And Teresa basically wanted to uh, refute some of those things, and so we're pleased to welcome her to, to this show to talk about those things. Thank you. Um, what, what in particular, um, you know, did you have or take issue with? Um, <coughs> one of the things that was said was Mr. Schaefer had said that he got all upset about the district when he realized the district could save taxpayers $2.5 million by changing insurance carriers. And that has been said many times. I don't really fault him for not knowing that that's not factually accurate. Actually, the only way to save that money would be to change the insurance plan as the plan sets. Simply changing car carriers would not save any money. It, you have to actually change the contents of the plan, which is subject to collective bargaining, which can then go to arbitration, et cetera, the QEO law, all of that. But, but to simply say, and it has been put out there, that just changing the carrier, actually, plan for plan, the carrier that the school district has now is the cheapest because it's a nonprofit organization, so they don't have as high um, administrative costs. So that was one thing. Then um, Mrs. Monty said that her big concern with the calendar was instructional minutes. Well, there are actually more instructional minutes in the this year's calendar, the 0506 calendar, than there were in the 0405 calendar. So that doesn't really wash that if you're very upset about this calendar and it's all due to instructional minutes because there actually are more mm -hmm. instructional minutes. And then finally <coughs> it was said that you know the school district is going to spend $250,000 for public relations. The board has not voted on that. They haven't even really discussed it. So that's not really accurate to say that they're laying that money out. That mm -hmm. is a recommendation from their PR group. but from any board meeting I've been at or watched, that has not yeah. been decided at all what, if any of that, they're going to take and do, do something with. So it was just, I was hoping there would be some questions from either you or Tony saying, well, isn't sure. it true? So yeah. that, I was just basically well, pointing I'm out to him for future right. reference that some of these things are not completely accurate. Right. Um, and, and certainly, I mean, we've got questions. Uh, obviously, Tony's aren't here. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, I hope you have some questions, but um, you know I I have some as well. Um, the the two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Why don't we start there? Um, you know, whatever the figure may be, um, it was just a couple years ago. In fact, when you were on the school board, that the the board voted to do away with the PR position. Um, now we've been using Blue Door Consulting as um, as a consultant, and it, that they have another proposal before the school board. I, I mean, how do you feel about that? Well, I was one of two, <coughs> Mr. Becker and I did not vote. We voted against eliminating that position because we did believe it was a needed um, position at the time. And I do think back the first time I ran for the school board, which I think was in 1998, I said one of the district's 
weakest areas was communication, and I believe that to still be true. I think they have to do something to the tune of $250,000. I'd be amazed if they ever found anywhere near that amount of money to put in the budget. It's mm -hmm. not, I mean, I don't know, unless someone donated it all. I don't know how that, and, and I would, I mean, I'm not on the board. I'm <coughs> going to have a vote on that, but I certainly wouldn't vote for $250,000 of that. That being said, something has to give, and they haven't been able to, you know, and, and frankly, once Mr. Werger's position was eliminated, I served on some PR committees, and I would sit there and say, this doesn't seem to be a good use of this, you know, a room with administrators who have more than enough things to do, and now they sit in another two-hour meeting trying to figure out, to me, that's not a good use of their time. They're education experts, not necessarily. I mean, yes, they need to be on board with how do you communicate with people, though you'll also find that most people think their children's school does a good job of communicating with them. It's just district as a whole, and the district even communicating with its own people. I mean, it amazes me sometimes the number of people who have no idea what's going on. And yeah. some of that's their own, just don't care, you know. The number of people who didn't even know who their school board, teachers even, who didn't know who their sure. school board members were. Why do you think the, the district has this communication problem? What I is mean, the communication problem? Lack of communicating what's going on all the time. Lack of, of doing a good job of tooting your own horn, letting people know. You know, I mean, the superintendent does a good job of, you know, here's this, these are our seven schools of promise. And the Northwestern has been better about, um, you know, but, you know, we have schools, seven schools of promise <coughs> in Oshkosh. The, M Milwaukee obviously has more, but <laughs> they have 100,000 <laughs> students, They're 10 times larger, as many. Yeah. Um, Madison is the only other district that has as many, and they're the second largest school district with... I think they have 25,000 mm -hmm. You know, so, I mean, that's something to really be proud of. There's a lot of good things going on. Um, I just think that there's a lot of, of lack of getting information out to people who need it. Who needs the information? Parents do the community. I mean, people need to know what's going on, what's happening. You know, um, uh, what curriculum changes. Huge things are going on in the curriculum based on what is going on with NCLB. I mean, I don't think people really understand that. I don't think, I know people don't understand things like, I sat in a, I, on one of those budget forums and <coughs> someone in our group said, well, I just think we should stop educating these little children. They shouldn't be in school. Well, that's federally mandated. You have to do that. It's, mm -hmm. But people don't understand that. There's not a good job of communicating what we do, why we do it, and what we have to do and what we need to do. Well, I, I don't I, I just want to follow up on yeah, this. On, as far as the $250,000 proposal for the uh, public relations person position, if Teresa Thiel was on the board now, would she vote in favor of that? $250,000? No. No. But there, it's not there. That money is not there. So, okay. no. so, so you don't think it's appropriate to put in a budget, the, the school board budget at this time, $250,000, over the five-year period for that position? Well, and, and it wasn't for that position alone. I mean, they weren't going to pay some right. $250,000. Right, there's obviously other things that go with it. But I, I, don't, I don't see how you could even, I mean, it, the circumstances they're in, I don't know how you could, I mean, it's, an, it's a laudable goal, but I think it's unreachable. F even five years from now, I don't know where that kind of money could be put into the budget. So that by, at the end of five years, there would be a line item of $250,000 in the budget coming from. Now, if they're talking about raising that money from outside sources, not taxpayer money, not you know, money from the state or whatever, mm -hmm. fine. You know, if you can find corporations or whoever to donate that kind of funds, then more power to you. But as far as coming out of the budget that exists, I don't see it happening. Okay. I, I know it's just a, you know, this Blue Door Consulting, or, or whoever the consultant might be. Um, I, I know it's just <coughs> a very small piece of, of the budgetary pie that, that the board has to work with. But, you know, in this day and age when, you know, the, the screws are really being put to every governmental agency when it comes to budgets and finance, um, you know, why do you folks in this district need to spend any money on tooting your own horn. And I'll look at Nina, uh, because I, I've watched school board meetings where, you know, some of the school board members have said, we're losing students to Nina. We're losing students to Nina. And Nina has an excellent, excellent reputation. Uh, not that Oshkosh is not a good district. It's a wonderful district. But, you know, when, when I hear our own school board members saying we're losing students to Nina, and Nina has no PR per person, mm -hmm. they never have, 
um, from the way they've indicated to me, they never will. Um, I mean, that could change too, but yeah. you know, they, they never have, and yet they do an outstanding job of promoting their district. Couldn't our district maybe learn some lessons from them and, and save that money? Well, I mean, number one, they <coughs> do have that reputation, so you don't need PR when you already have your reputation there. Um, and, and just because Oshkosh's reputation isn't what needs is doesn't mean we're not as good a school district, but right. people's perceptions is their reality. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, and I bet I don't have those figures with me, but Nina has about half as many students as Oshkosh does, yet their number of administrators, I believe they have 20, I think it, well, I'm not going to give numbers because I don't remember, but they have, they do not have half as many administrators as we do. They have closer to as many administrators as we do than they do to half as many. So they probably have people who can spend that time. I mean, our administrators are stretched very, very thin. And it, it makes it difficult for people to take on those additional tasks. And, you know, maybe they're fortunate enough to have people that, that have that expertise. I don't know. I just know that every time you lose a student in this day and age and in this climate, you are losing dollars that then affect everything you can do. And... Um, I mean, I, I have not read the entire Blue Door from beginning to end, but I, have, I did see the presentation. I think there's a lot of things in there that make a lot of sense. I mean, I've never seen anything that I've agreed with from beginning to end, any program or at whatever. But I do think there's some things in there that can be very useful. I think they have been helpful, and I'm pretty sure, though I haven't seen bills, that they're not billing us what they would bill most other clients. Mm -hmm. But I, I think something has to happen, and you have to build that reputation up. And... Um, I mean, the figures that I, that I pulled up, Oshkosh is a very, very low spending district. And as you keep getting fewer and fewer students, that just puts the, the it just pinches what you're doing so badly that I don't know how long we can ma maintain the reputation that we have as a good quality school system when you continually have to cut and cut and cut. Mm -hmm. Paul, go ahead. Can we use, you and I were both on a focus group mm -hmm. uh, for the school board. Uh, instead of spending thousands of dollars on Blue Door Consulting, or anyone for that matter, I, that, that just happens to be the, who the board picked um, or the administration picked, can't we use focus groups? I, I know you were on a, on a board for redistricting, um, and I thought you know you and I didn't agree on, on issues on, mm -hmm. on these focus groups, which is good in my opinion. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, I think we need to get everyone's opinion out there, and some things should be brought to the board. I mean, can't we use that for future to? to to propel the school district in the future. And what happened to that, that study that you and I were on and, and all the other, Cheryl was on a focus group, mm -hmm. whatever happened to that? Well, it's all posted on the website, all the little colored groups and what they had to say. But one of my frustrations with that group in and of itself, and that's where the whole communication piece, again, people were saying a lot of things <coughs> based in not understanding. I mean, granted, I've been studying this district since 1997. I attended almost every school board meeting since my now eighth grader started kindergarten. I don't expect people to do that. But people say, th you know, oh, let's just do away with that early childhood piece. Well, we can't. I mean, so you, you can't just ask people what they think if they don't have a basis in this is what we have to do. You know, they need some education about what they're going to be deciding. Um, and, and that's the piece that needs to happen. Yes, that's how you get input. And that's also been difficult to figure out. I mean, I don't think we have the expertise in the district to know how do you get that broad range. I mean, you want to go back to the whole boundary committee that I served on. The way that was made up was send a note out to every school asking for two people, I think it was, or for people who are interested in participating. Well, as it turned out, the people that participated were people that were directly affected. Well, that's going to skew what your results are, rather than if you have a broad range of people who have not a personal direct, my child might be moved interest. So it's very difficult, and I don't have the answers to how to do that. I have no expertise in that area. But looking back, that was part of our problem of how things evolved because it was not a broad cross-section of people. And yeah, you, you take all that and know this is what people said, but you know, people can say things like, well, when I was in school, there were 35 kids in a class. You know, when I was in school, there were 35 kids in a class. And every child had a mother who stayed at home, except for one whose father was dead. Um, that's not the world I see. I mean, even from the time my eighth grader started kindergarten till the time my sixth grader was in third grade, I saw a huge change of things that were going on at Jefferson. Kids with more and more needs, with more and more family, intense family situations. You can't compare, I can't compare. My daughter probably in eighth grade can't compare what's going on now to what went on then. 
so people don't have that understanding. I mean, I saw it firsthand for seven and a half years, what, what that was like, what seeing the evolutions, working with a child one-on-one, -on -one, sitting there and saying, how could a teacher possibly have 35 kids when I've worked with this child <coughs> just trying to get them to distinguish a penny from a nickel from a dime, okay? For six months, one child, 15 to 20 minutes a day, three to four days a week. How, how is a teacher with 35 kids ever going to, ha you know, those are the things people are facing. So I think people need to have some understanding of what, you can't just have, well, this is what I think, mm -hmm. if it doesn't fit into what reality is. And the reality of it is, I mean, I really want to get this statistic out there. There are 426 school districts in the state of Wisconsin. If you look at revenue per member, and this I took off a DPI website, this is the 2003-2004 data. Um, and this was all, any school district that had 5,001 students or more. Oshkosh is 394th in revenue per member. So basically per pupil spending. So that's a good thing, isn't it? <laughs> well, what it tells me is people keep saying, find efficiencies, find efficiencies. There are only 32 school districts in the state that spend less than we do. How much more efficient can we get? How, uh, to what point? I mean, do you never increase your budget for the next 10 years? Is that what we're looking at? To me, this says we are at the bone. And now to say cuts more cuts, and my understanding is a million dollars needs to be cut out of the 0607 budget. Uh, just a question, and maybe I don't have this factually correct. Uh, wasn't there, you said we're at the bone, wasn't there $800,000 in excess funds found from some fund? So, Are you talking about in the surplus? Yeah. So if we're at the bone, how did we, where did this $800,000, and, and did we tax too much? if we've come up with that $800,000. Well, I would argue, yes, there may be that there's surplus. I haven't followed it as closely as I did when I was on the board. Probably has something to do with how you estimate your um, staffing costs and what your actual staffing costs are. I mean, you estimate, I think, along a mid-range, and yet if you have more new teachers, you're paying them less, whatever, people retire. I don't really fully understand. But I would say, no, we didn't tax too much because we have cut many things that affect kids. We no longer have intramurals at the middle school. We no longer, um, I mean, I don't even remember all the cuts we made. You know, we've charged user fees for now. We have user fees for athletics. We have user mm -hmm. fees for music. We, the situation that I saw at Jefferson, they could use a full-time, you know, and they did find, I think it was a .45. They were able to find, finally for this year get a four, .45 math person. But, I mean, that school, in my opinion, could use a full-time, Actually, in reality, if you truly wanted to leave no child behind and meet every kid's needs, probably a full-time math slash, well, maybe not reading because they do really well, but a math tutor for every grade level there. I mean, I was in classrooms where there were 20 kids and maybe half of them struggled with simple, you know, and it's not the fault of teachers not being dedicated. I've never seen a more dedicated group of people who went, I mean, I knew a teacher who three days a week tutored kids after school who needed help every single day. Mm -hmm. um, there are serious needs out there that are not being met. And I think that there, there are, <coughs> I mean, we don't have enough counselors, in, the, in my opinion, in the elementary situation. Jefferson gets two and a half days a week of counseling for a school of 250 children, almost 60% of which qualify for free or reduced lunch. There are huge and serious needs. But there's always, well, we can't add any more, we can't add any more, we can't add any more personnel. So I would argue no. I don't think when we are at the bottom that we're taxing too much, we're, we're trying to keep our head above water. There are a lot of needs that just frankly aren't being met and aren't going to be met because we're not going to tax anymore. But I don't understand how they're going to find another million dollars to cut. And, and it frustrates me, and I understand why politically this is not the climate, but they levied a million dollars less than they could have. I don't know, you know, you, people say, oh, I don't believe in, the, you know, just change the insurance plans and let it fall, let the chips fall where they may. Well, you go to arbitration with that because you have to if you don't give a 3-8 QEO. Should the teachers be giving, com uh, I mean, should they be coming to you saying, we understand the needs in, uh, of, of this district and we want to better help uh, students? Our salaries and our benefits make up, I don't know, what is it, 70% of the 80, budget, 80, whatever 80 it is. Um, here's what we're willing to do. Um, why do we have to, and this is true for the city and for the county, why do we have to beg, borrow, and try to steal from folks when, if, if, they're, if they're charges to help students, wouldn't it be their responsibility to come and say, we do want to help these students, we don't want to cut intramurals, we don't want, we want teachers there for them. Here's what we're willing to do. Why do we have to 
always go to ar the, the threat of arbitration with something like that. Well, and frankly, in this in this situation, I believe. I mean, there's no way to ever know. It's like a jury trial. But the district would be hard-pressed to prove the number one thing they look at, which is ability to pay, when for three years in a row you didn't levy to your limit. How can you say that you didn't have the ability? You chose not to do what it was, so you probably wouldn't even win an arbitration case. Should we, but should we levy to the limit? I think given how low we are in spending and the needs that we have that are, un that are not being met, yeah, I think. And knowing that you're going to cut a million dollars next year when you had a million dollars that you didn't levy, I don't really see that as the best decision to be made. I mean, if we were in Madison make spending $12,000 per pupil, yeah, then maybe no. But we are Oshkosh, 394 out of 426. How long do you think you can continue that and keep your reputation? I don't know. And as far as your question about teachers coming to you and saying, here, if I were in that bargaining group, my fear would be, here, and then the kids don't get bad. It just all goes back to the taxpayers, and the kids still don't have intramurals, still don't have anything. And now I've given all this up for what? They are not in a climate right now with, with the, the things that are sometimes sad. The th I mean, <coughs> I don't think you're in a climate to be looking for concessions from people when, n when you have the opportunity and you just say, we're not going to levy the limit. Not saying, oh, the things you want to do with that money are superfluous. Just saying no. I mean, it, the decision is based before you even look at what would we do if we levied to the limit with this money. It's just, no, we're going to keep it down. We can't levy to the limit because people don't like it. I get that. I mean, I pay taxes too, but I'm willing to make those choices. I mean, for me, my house isn't worth a whole lot. That extra million dollars in my pocket would probably be about 25 bucks. That's one couple, one dinner. A couple butter burger family. baskets. A couple butter baskets. I mean, it's baskets. one dinner for my family at a fast food restaurant, the four of us. Well, um, it's a choice. He here's the thing, though. Um, you know, I, I understand about unions and, and their members not necessarily wanting to make concessions. None of us wants to make concessions and, and have things taken away that, that we've worked very hard to get. And yet, when elected officials just keep taxing to the limit or wanting to, trying to, it's, it's the little folks, it's the taxpayers, yourselves included as, as elected officials, who take it in the shorts. And, you know, we're the ones who have to make the concessions. You're fortunate, you know, your, your husband works uh, uh, as a teacher. Um, I don't know, do you work an outside job? Or? I do now, yes, okay. as of January. So you've got a two-income family. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot of aging folks in this community who are on limited incomes. And, you know, they're, they're past the age of retirement. And, uh, you know, they, their income isn't going to get any greater than what it is unless there's a raise in Social Security. And these folks, and I've talked to a number of them, they are literally feeling like they're being taxed out of their homes how many more concessions can they make and why should it be the the taxpayer who's always making the concessions well if you th i mean this is another figure i got this came from the school district's budget actually in every year except the 2004-2005 school year the tax the equalized tax rate the per per thousand value has gone down so actually people you know, five years ago, we're paying eight dollars and eighty some cents per thousand. Oh five, oh six, it's seven dollars and seventy eight cents. So, and you know, until this year, a lot of people's houses didn't appreciate in value. So you really weren't paying more in the school tax. But your out of pocket expenses have gone up. And so has the school districts. That's my question. Do we just never increase the school district's budget because people don't want to pay any more taxes? Even though all their costs go up, then you have to cut programs, you have to cut staff, you have to increase class sizes, which I, from my experience of seven years, is not in the best interest of children. And it comes down mostly to choices. I mean, I know what it's like to live paycheck to paycheck. When my husband, when we first moved to Oshkosh and he had a job and I stayed home with my children, we live paycheck to paycheck, and it's like, oh, great, car insurance is due. <laughs> what are we going to do this yeah. month? Well, we won't pay this bill. I know what that's like, but I still never said, huh, I just want my school taxes to go down because I value the education, and I'm willing to make whatever choices it takes to pay for that. Sure. That kind of leads us, and in, in we're down to like four minutes. Um, <laughs> not a lot of time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but that, that kind of leads me into a question from, from a viewer. Um, Mrs. Thiel has expressed her ideas and opinions about how the district should run and how to make improvements on a variety of topics, such as communication, where to hold public forum meetings, 
certain expansions of programs, etc. Property taxes just took a huge jump. How is Mrs. Thiel expecting the district to pay for additional staffing and resources? And I'm a, I guess based on what I mean, she I said. I mean, I guess, you know, it's too late now, but they didn't levy what, what they could have. Um, and in, the, in this circumstance, it doesn't matter even if they levy to the limit, they're going to have to cut, so it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. But I do think it's unfortunate. Here's a simple question for you. So election coming up in April. You're obviously very passionate about this, and I appreciate that. Um, is Teresa Thiel going to be on the ballot? I mean, as they say, never say never, but I don't see it happening. I mean, my circumstances haven't changed from when I lost. So, you know, my husband's still a teacher in the district. I can't change that. So, One other question think. about the board now and when you were on it. Um, and it's the same with the council and, and the, uh, the county. Always seems to be some friction with some people. Is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? Um, disagreements are a good thing. The way things get personal are not a good thing. I mean, I watched the board back, you know, like I said, since 97, and things were not quite that personal and, and people, you know, almost attacking people for what they believe as opposed to just disagreeing with, with positions. Who's, it do, who's doing the attacking? I'm not getting, getting into that. <laughs> well, we even see that in, in elections, yeah. you know, in campaigns. Sure. You know, they go after personal type things rather than attacking issues. And yet, even when you attack issues, there are people out there who say, oh, you know, you're mudslinging and I just and don't see it. Um, real quickly then, one other question. How does Mrs. Thiel feel about redistricting and shifting school borders? Well, and as you know, they can read the Oshkosh News blog where I gave a little bit of my viewpoints, but I believe you need to start over from scratch. Look at the district, the river, the, the highway, that doesn't come into play. And you have to redistrict and make things as, as even as possible. And I still believe from my experience years ago that you're going to have to build probably one new school to com combine and consolidate several schools because it is more efficient to run bigger schools. Not too big, not over 500, but it's just more efficient rather than trying to fix failing buildings or rebuilding a school of 150. It doesn't make sense. What schools would you want to see combined? Well, I'm not running, so um, <laughs> I think, I th <laughs> well, you know, I mean, that, that's a killer. But um, uh, schools like Green Meadow, Lincoln, and, well, Sunset is in Tipler, so that's probably okay. But, I mean, maybe even Oakland. These, these small schools combined in a central location somewhere, to put those together. I mean, obviously not Green Meadow with Lincoln and... Uh, and uh, Oakland, but I think Lincoln and Oakland, some kind of combination with a new school over there because that whole north side, and then reshift all your boundaries. So the kids, you know, whoever's on a bus now, maybe bus to this new school, whoever's walking now would still be able to walk. And uh, nobody wants to hear it, but I think I've heard that there's room for Shapiro, in Shapiro for all of Green Meadow. A number of years ago, the figure was $330,000 in operating costs saved because you eliminate a full time secretary and a full time custodian off the bat, and then points of reading specialist, counselor, et cetera, that would just be at a, you know. I think we're at that point. 125 kids is, you, you can't be efficient when you have 18 kids in a class and you only have one grade. You can't, you can't fix that. You had, um, just real quickly, you, you had uh, voted when you were on the board to close the pool at South Park. Mm -hmm. And now you want it reopened? That's correct, because we were told we would save $100,000 in the budget, and the actual figure was closer to twenty or 25000 And we're looking at ways to fund some of that, get an actual cost, save some money, et cetera. Okay. All right. Any closing thoughts in the last, like, 20 seconds that we have? Well, I, I just think it's, it's nice to say you've got to be more efficient, efficiencies, efficiencies, but we are almost at the bottom in the whole entire state, so there aren't a lot of efficiencies to find. Okay. All right. Very good. Thanks for coming on, Thank uh, you. especially on kind of short notice here. So, although not as short as Paul's <laughs> notice. <laughs> Thanks very much. And uh, we're going to take a short break. We, we will be right back in about two minutes. And when we come back, we'll be joined by two folks representing the Coles Bashford House. Uh, it's a uh, historic home here in the city of Oshkosh in danger of being lost. And we'll find out why and what can be done to stop that in just a couple of minutes. We'll be right back. We just escaped. I escaped. I escaped. By foot. Run across the border. I couldn't practice my religion. I was put to work in the forced labor camps. If I stay in Cambodia, I would have been dead by now. If you think differently, then you're an enemy. If you know how to read and write, you're dead. You speak your mind, you're dead. The only way to express what I wanted to do was to get out. I got to the country when I was about 14 years old. I was 20. I was 24. I came here with nothing. No money, no English. 
America stood for freedom, it stands for freedom, and that's why all my generation, young generation, wanted to be there. For the first time, I felt like I have a right to be on this earth. Here, you can do whatever you want to do. I love my life here. I feel at home. I'm free to do what I want. Freedom to me means my life. <laughs> How you doing? Hi. Hi. Have a nice day. You too. Thanks. If only child abuse were this easy to recognize. If you even suspect abuse, call 1-800-4-A-CHILD. All calls are anonymous and confidential. Trust your instincts. Poor nutrition today will increase Sarah's chances of anemia, add to her health care costs, sick days, even stunt her ability to learn. And the thing is, Sarah's not even born yet. Get proper nutrition before it's too late. Call or visit WIC. WIC provides nutrition information, health care referrals, even food. Your child has you, and you have WIC. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the second half of I and Oshkosh. I'm Cheryl Hentz, and my uh, guest host this evening is uh, Paul Esslinger from the Oshkosh Common Council. For those of you just joining us who maybe missed the explanation of that at the beginning of the show, uh, Tony Palmieri had an emergency um, at nearly the last minute, and, and Paul was available and kind enough to say, yes, he would indeed sit here and... Uh, and help me out, so I appreciate that. Um, we're now very pleased to be joined by two people who are very active in trying to save a historic home here in the city of Oshkosh. It is the Coles Bashford House. It's located over on Oshkosh Avenue. And um, you know, for those of you who don't know anything about the house, aren't familiar with its history, we're going to find out a little bit about that. From, to my immediate left, uh, Jan Butterbrot. And to her immediate left is Terry Labe. Uh, as I said, both are very active in trying to save the Coles, ba Coles Bashford House. That's a mouthful to say. <laughs> and uh, we're, we're pleased to welcome them to the show. So thanks very much for, for being here tonight. Well, thank, thank you, you very much for having us. Um, why don't you first tell folks about the house? And I know, Terry, you have a picture there that um, if, if you want to hold up at some point, that would be good. Because people may not recognize the name, but I bet they recognize the house. In, indeed, uh, Cheryl, the the house was originally built in 1855, and it still stands on its same site, which is pretty significant. We don't have that many houses in Oshkosh that are pre-Civil War, and uh, this is a significant one. The, the image that we have for you is the way the house looked in 1875. Coles Bashford built it in 1855, sold it to Robert McMillan in 1875, and uh, Coles Bashford, the first Republican governor of the state of Wisconsin, then moved to the Arizona Territory where he continued his political life. Robert McMillan was a very successful sawmill owner in Oshkosh, uh, ultimately built a grand house on Algoma, but he, he did live in this house <coughs> and he did create some of the changes that are evident in this image. This photo is important uh, simply because we've really selected this as the target for the restoration should we be able to ultimately save the house from demolition and raise the funds to to properly restore it today the porch is missing uh, the dormers are, are off um, the fancy work and the gable ends are gone the house is covered with eight inch wide aluminum siding and so a lot of its original exterior character and charm are lost uh, most of that can still be found in the interior however in the front rooms, the main staircase, the foyer, the two wings off to the side of, of the front are also original. <coughs> and they show that with the eight foot tall double hung windows and so forth. Mm -hmm. Terry, how, how much is it gonna cost to get it to where you would you and your group would like to see it? Um, and what ultimately then is going to happen with the house if you get it uh, refurbished? We, we think that, um, we look at that as two phases. And the first phase would be to get the house in shape in the interior suitable for a tenant and we think that that would cost could cost up to two hundred thousand an additional two hundred thousand would do the restoration those are basically budget numbers best guess kind of thing uh, we have a potential 
tenant lined up for the house who could make really good use of it, and Jan can share that with you. And we just feel that the startup costs to set up the interior properly for this tenant would be about 200000 Well, let's go back for just a moment. I mean, this house is on the 10 most endangered properties uh, list in the state of Wisconsin. Um, why, why is it in such a predicament where it may be demolished? It was actually slated to be demolished in the springtime and um, in uh, that <coughs> wonderful article by Doug Zelmer um, brought it to the attention of people in Oshkosh but also to the attention of people in the state of Wisconsin. And it was actually nominated to be on the most endangered list by somebody who lives not in Oshkosh. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the reason being is that um, a new daycare has been um, built in addition. And so children are no longer in what we lovingly refer to as the White House. And so at this point in time, it, it is standing empty. And the thought had been to demolish it. And by the article and by the fact that it was placed on the most endangered list, bought some time. And that's kind of where we're at now is we keep buying some time to, um, to raise the funds and um, to, uh, to get other tenants in it. And as Terry said, right now um, we're in discussion with Labor of Love. And Labor of Love um, is a home for unwed pregnant gals. And um, they are looking at a larger home in order to have house parents. They're also looking at um, expanding some of their programs. And so having a home such as the Coles Bashford House, along with the fact that there's certainly ample elbow room, mm -hmm. um, because it really is an estate, um, this would just offer them wonderful opportunities to expand their programming. If you don't mind, as Terry highlighted, um, one of the pictures of the houses, if it's possible, I'd love to show this because this yes. gives you kind of a, a, the ambience of the era that this is, what is it, the second oldest home in Winnebago County. And we have, we have heard wo these wonderful stories from people about, about the home and um, the fact that it had been just majestic in its, in its, you know, the grandeur of the time. We've heard that again, the furniture of it is, it was just beautiful at this time. But it was a 65 acre estate and um, it was my interest in it is that in 1911 it was opened up as an orphanage by Elizabeth Batchelder Davis in response to her husband had grown up in an orphanage out east and she was appalled simply appalled at his stories of what it was like growing up in an orphanage out east the children were seen more as slave labor and and so she left an inheritance that um, an estate be purchased and that it would, it would open its doors for children and that the children would feel a part of it and so it was a working farm and that they <coughs> would be given an opportunity to be educated and that was vitally important. And so, as I say, it was a 65 acre estate. It was a working farm. And there is Westfield, the street Westfield now um, um, has divided it out. But there's a beautiful home on the corner that has been renovated. And if you look in the back of that built, that, that, that um, property, you'll see kind of a mustard yellow um, building. And we believe that that was one of the, the carriage houses hmm, okay. of the original estate. So, um, as I said, right now we're in discussion with um, Labor of Love that they would be our tenants because we think it would be just a wonderful, wonderful complement to one of the original purposes of, um, of the E.B. Davis. Estate. And they're very cramped. I mean, for anyone who, who is unfamiliar with where Labor of, Labor of Love is, it's right across the street from where we're taping. And it's, I mean, it's a really nice facility, but it is extremely small mm -hmm. considering the number of um, clients that they're trying to serve. Mm -hmm. So this would probably be a, a good location for them. Terry, you're talking about between two hundred and four hundred thousand dollars to refurbish it. Are there any costs involved in, in buying it? And who would ultimately own it and rent it out? The, um, the agreement that we, that we have a, uh, an agreement signed with the uh, Davis Foundation in which we would simply lease it 
from the Davis Foundation for a nominal amount, dollar a year, five dollars mm -hmm. a year. We would be responsible for the entire upkeep and maintenance of the house and some of the grounds that relate to it. And so the Davis Foundation would retain control of it and their interest there is that, well, what if our, our board changes and, and um, things don't work as well as, as they, they would like to have the ultimate control of it and we, we find that that's certainly reasonable. Mm -hmm. Part of there's 4.5 acres of land with that house which includes that wonderful park-like setting with the great oaks on the east and you know that needs to be uh, retained uh, uh, by the Davis Foundation. And so to, to have us and, and we're incorporated as the friends of the Coles Bashford House um, we have filed the articles of incorporation we're waiting for our nonprofit status to come back and, 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 and as such, we would be responsible for, uh, we would take the responsibility of the maintenance of this house off the shoulders of the Davis Foundation, which is uh, paramount <coughs> to them. They, they need to be able to run their daycare operation as well as they can, and they don't really have the time to, to spend a lot of time and money on this particular house. The, um, um, the average monthly utility bills can be, I think, a thousand, did we say? I think about a thousand, and so that's that's significant. A lot more than that. The way utility costs are going. <laughs> well, it could be a lot worse. That's true. Uh, so, how are you doing with your with your efforts so far? Where are you at? We we have one major donor who's come forward with twenty five thousand. We have several hundred dollar donors. Uh, we're 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 just probably at twenty six or twenty seven thousand now. Our agreement with the Davis Foundation was to raise two hundred thousand by October one. Half of what we. Needed. Mm -hmm. And we are taping this. Uh, th this will start airing uh, Monday yes. after we do this taping. We're taping this on the 22nd of September, so the clock is ticking very, very quickly. And, uh, you know, before we let you folks dash tonight, we'll give you an opportunity to tell folks how and where they can send yes. their donations and so forth. That's really important. We've talked about, you know, the costs that you need right now, you yes. know, immediate mm -hmm. costs. What kind of future costs are you looking at and where would those come from? We we'd expect to build an endowment of at least 200000 so that we would have that income to defray expenses over the years and, and that endowment could, could grow as well. In, the, um, in terms <coughs> of the, the fundraising, uh, we were not good weather forecasters and so we've <laughs> run right into Katrina and now her sister. Uh, and, and, so, and so that has been a huge effort uh, to provide humanitarian relief for fellow Americans. And, uh, and I think uh, all of the nonprofits and the people who are out there looking for uh, donated money were, were having trouble because everyone is stretched a little thin. It's a difficult time, I think, for everyone because of the scare relative to gas prices and mm -hmm. to what ultimate effect um, the weather will have on our economy and, and the war in Iraq and all of these things leave us all a little, a little uh, looking inward more than outward mm -hmm. when um, at the same time a case could be made for uh, putting an effort forward to save this historic house when other historic houses have likely been lost due to, due to weather. There's, there's, another, there's, there's also immediate needs cultural and social and and the cultural need relative to saving this historic house is really mated with a great social need and that is positive social change to help unwed mothers through their transition phase and that house is very well suited for that and I think it would be one of the first times that an arrangement was put together which combined historic preservation and social social good and and we always felt that it would be a great combination for givers in that uh, <coughs> if you weren't particularly interested in in social programs but liked historic architecture you could give in that venue. Labor of Love has their own uh, fundraising campaign. They have a uh, their their big year uh, event is this Saturday which is the walk which is their big fundraiser. They, they can appeal to uh, church and faith-based groups, groups who are interested in helping women and so we have uh, multiple faceted uh, areas to, f to, to try to get funding from, but we thought we would be much further ahead than 26,000 at this time. We contacted the foundation. Uh, we have to have our nonprofit status letter first before we could proceed, but there's some possibility there. S surely we won't have anything by October 1st. 
we are calling on, making personal calls on uh, people who could be major donors and um, well, we're going we're gonna to work right down to the 11th hour and uh, put a good effort in, a good faith effort in mm -hmm. to try to, uh, to make this happen. Can you get an extension past October 1st if need we be? Don't or? We don't know. We don't know. You know, we, we talked about labor, I don't know why I'm having a tough time <laughs> saying that. It's just been a long <laughs> week so far. We've talked about labor of love possibly going in there. Um, whoever would go in there. Um, what, what, what do you say to someone in the community who says, well, you know, unwed mothers doesn't affect me. An old house doesn't affect me. How does the community as a whole benefit by saving this house? Because once it's gone, it's gone. I mean, you know, for many of us who have ever gone into New Orleans, and we think of those beautiful, beautiful buildings. I mean, they're gone. They're simply gone. But we have an opportunity to save this beautiful building. The other reason is, and again, I think it is it's so wonderful to be in this program, uh, Eyes on, on Oshkosh, for the fact that the eyes of Wisconsin are on this. A third of our donors are outside of Oshkosh. Mm -hmm. So again, I mean, we're under the spotlight. And we've got an opportunity. But once it's gone, it's gone. Mm -hmm. You won't get it back. And this is structurally sound. And if you were to walk in the front doors, it is magnificent, absolutely magnificent. It has it has curved wood. It has it has um, bevel glass. It has this beautiful staircase. And again, I mean, the stories that this house could tell. Once it's gone, it's gone. Terry, I, you know, you're very well versed in, in refurbishing old. I mean, you've done hundreds, if not thousands, of buildings. Uh, are there any grants from the state or from the federal government no. that could help out at all here? No, all the all the money <coughs> that uh, we describe as bricks and mortar money went away in the Reagan years in the early mm -hmm. '80s. Those were before that there was grant money available for actual work on these on these on these buildings, but that's been gone uh, for 25 years. Um, the only thing that remains are tax credits, but if you're a nonprofit, you don't pay taxes. Mm -hmm. right. If you're if it's privately owned, a tax a taxpayer could get state and federal tax credits up to about 25 percent of the cost, which is a significant inducement for people who privately hold uh, historic houses. Mm -hmm. But uh, in this case, it, it doesn't help us. It doesn't help us. What, uh, I mean, obviously, you know, the city, uh, you know, this is on the city tax rolls, I would assume, or it may be, or as a, as a nonprofit, it's not. But the mm -hmm. city certainly has has a stake in, I would think, wanting to preserve this house. Are you working closely with the city um, in this venture? Well, we, we have certainly, the first thing we did in, in uh, April was to contact uh, community development regarding any zoning issues relative mm -hmm. to labor of love, and <coughs> then um, contacted them regarding um, block grant money that might be available, mm -hmm. and all of that's certainly possible. Mm -hmm. and, and, and even the zoning with, uh, up to eight uh, residences, zoning change is, is an easy one. It's not a diff it's not an impasse, and so um, the Landmarks Commission has been very supportive of us. They've been through the house a couple times and keep asking us, uh, you know, how they can help, and we keep telling them to buy lottery tickets. You know, <laughs> 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 one other We're one not other promoting gambling. That's but right. We're desperate. And that's right. One other um, <laughs> uh, long shot is HGTV has a grant. And um, uh, Chuck Williams, our third member of, of, the, of this board, um, is applying to them to see. But again, the 11th hour is approaching and some of this long range stuff may not happen. There's, there's a great fund, fund, funding source in Janesville by Tom Jeffries who, who um, uh, foots the bill up to two hundred dollars to $300,000 on matching grants. But his is a very slow process. He will first do $10,000 to do a study which can take a year or two, mm. you see. And, and so we, we, we're not at that point where we can just plot along. Um, again, um, <coughs> the, the board of uh, directors of the Davis Foundation, they, when they see that on their agenda week after week, and they have, they're all working regular jobs, they're there as volunteers, they have precious hours, and, uh, they're, and that is really their, their motivation in, in, in making it go away. And uh, does not seem to be a really good reason from our perspective. Uh, especially if we can offer them a way out. In other words, if we can offer them to relieve them of the funding problems with it. And so we, we would hope to be able to, if we can't make our goal, to have a, an opportunity to talk to them about allowing us to pick up the utilities for the winter, allowing some more funding to, to come about. Um, 
Well, I, I would, you know, I would think that if we could get close to 100,000, things would look better. They have to know it's going to succeed, and they have to know that we're committed to it. Mm -hmm. uh, without that, they have no reason to just delay their agony, so mm -hmm. to speak. Mm -hmm. You know, and also in follow-up to the question you asked sure. earlier about why should people pay attention to this, it, this is really a feel-good kind of a story. Again, I mean, you know, this has been going on for over a century. And again, if we can keep that going, and there's so many things in the world that, that are, are sad and negative. As a matter of fact, I've been in the mental health field for over 20-some years. My last client of the day said that every time you turn on the news, it's doomy, it's gloomy, it's perpetuating PSD symptoms for many individuals and stuff. And, and we need something to embrace. We need something that's going to give us hope that is long-lasting and enduring. And, and again, Mrs. Davis wanted to enrich and better children's lives. And that's our future. That's our future. And that's why I'm hoping that, that the community will embrace this. I'm hoping the state will embrace it, but send money. <laughs> <laughs> where do they send the um, money yes, to? Yes, where do, great. Um, to the friends of the Coles Bashford House, or just friends, they can write the um, people writing just friends on the check and friends on the envelope. And it's a P.O. Box, P.O. Box 2202, Oshkosh, Wisconsin, zip code 54903, dash 2202 and again let me go through that again it's friends at p.o box 2202 oshkosh wisconsin zip code 54903-2202 what if they just wanted to pick up the phone and call one of you guys um oh, they sure. can call me on my cell phone and that is area code 920-450-8988 and again Area code nine two zero four five zero eight nine eight eight. And we'll uh, before you know we end in about eight minutes or so. We're going to uh, give that information again. So if you didn't have an <coughs> opportunity to get it, um, why don't you take a second, go grab some paper and a pen or a pencil, and uh, and we'll be sure and give that to you before it ends. Um, so it's the board uh... for the coles bashford house that will make the decision on whether or not to grant an extension past october first it's the 1st. board of the davis foundation okay mm -hmm. okay and, and it can get kind of complicated because there's actually three boards and i'm on several boards i'm on the board of the eb davis foundation and we know how you'll be voting right <laughs> <laughs> right yes <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, they wanted, you know, I, again, um, it, yes, I'll be the torchbearer of this, of this program and stuff. So then, um, in response to saving it, we formed the Friends of the Coles Bashford Board of Directors. And as Terry said, Chuck Williams and Terry Lave and myself are, are, are the, the board members on that. And we are in discussion with another board, and that is Labor of Love. So we have these three boards, but it really is the E.B. Davis board, okay. um, the foundation that will be making the decisions as to an extension or call up the bulldozers. Okay. Mm -hmm. ha have you folks run into any other um, roadblocks uh, in, in your fundraising efforts? I mean, Hurricane Cortina. <laughs> I, I cannot <laughs> talk tonight. It's been a while. I'm thinking Rita oh, yeah. and, and <laughs> the Hurricanes. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, the twin sisters here. Mm -hmm. um, the Hurricanes um, have and will cause problems, obviously, mm -hmm. for all kinds of, of nonprofits. Other than that, have you folks encountered some hurdles um, that have taken money away from your cause? Hmm, I haven't specifically found that it's it's that you either have a donor or you don't mm -hmm. you know and I've never I haven't had anyone uh, tell me that they they were um, saturated that they had spent their budget of giving for this year we have people we have more people who could be significant givers in January mm -hmm. because this came up and we began in May June and July mm -hmm. and those those people that do charitable giving every year had already committed their funds and so well, while we missed the boat there, we have an opportunity in January to, to, uh, to, get, to get to it again. And I, and I think, you know, in that regard, rather than just, just give you empty words, prior to the October 1st, I'll be contacting those people. And if I can get a, a, a written pledge, take that to the board. Anything that we can that's a bona fide and an honest effort to, 
to save the house and to save them some trouble, uh, we will we'll bring forward. And, and uh, hopefully as a result of, uh, of this airing, uh, we'll get some more people to come forward and help us. Mm -hmm. Well, we certainly hope that, you know, that something will, will come of this. I, I know we kind of put this together very last minute. You folks called, and um, I just I felt that it was something important that, that we get well, we you on. We appreciate that. So, we so do. Can um, we also ask, to that, again, if, if, if people have stories, because that's what I'm so deeply touched by, the stories that have come forward by the children who grew up in the orphanage and have identified that it, it just meant everything to them to have a safe place to, to grow up and mm -hmm. be educated. That again, we welcome those stories. Um, it, and, it's, and it's just been wonderful to hear those enduring stories. Mm -hmm. So maybe they're not able necessarily to write a big check. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, anything, but also we, we, we appreciate and encourage the stories as well. Sure. Too. Um, do you folks have um, either a website or an email address or anything like that or, or no? Um. We can we could use my email address. That, okay. that would that would be fine. And that is T Labe mm -hmm. Restoration at NEW dot RR dot com. And I, I have this information, um, and we'll get it on our website, uh, the Ion Oshkosh website, because we know we're throwing a lot at you. Lab is not always the easiest name to spell. Okay. So, um, Terry, why don't you give that one more time? T Labe Restoration. Restoration at new.rr.com. Okay. All right. And if you want to make a donation, you can do that. Large or small, they will take any amount of money. Um, you can just send it to friends. That's easy enough to remember. P.O. Box 2202, Oshkosh, Wisconsin, 54903-2202. Or you can call Jan Butterbrot at 920 Four five zero eight nine eight eight, and again, we'll get this stuff up on our website um, so that you can refer to it there if if you didn't catch it during this show. Um, we're down to about a minute, minute and a half. Give us some closing thoughts. Well, I'd like to to, to go back to to one question you had, Paul. What good does it do to the community? And and there's an economic boost here if uh, labor of love is successfully able to bring seven or eight um, young uh, unmarried women through um, uh, a few months of difficulty. With this house and the programs, they could give them job skills. The children could stay, they could actually stay in a safe environment with their babies right. for while they learn homemaking skills, job skills, get out to the job market. So it's an extension of the care that they're able to give now, which, which relieves the burden for city services. Right. Sure, mm -hmm. that makes sense. So, mm -hmm. and that, that helps all of us. Mm -hmm. Indeed, it does. Mm -hmm. So, again, uh, Friends, P.O. Box 2202, Oshkosh, 54903 2202. Jan, thank you. Terry, thank, thank you very you. much for being thank here. You. And so thank you much. for joining us. Paul, thank you for being here. We'll see you next time. Take good care. And until then, keep your eye on us. We've got our eye on Oshkosh. <laughs>